Bruce. I can't understand why we can't offer them one of our ready-made designs. Phil. You don't understand at all. Bruce looked at his deputy. I don't want it like everyone else's. We live at a juncture when styles. Materials. Accents change. It's like Baroque replaced Renaissance in the past. So many possibilities open up. I certainly recognize that you're a genius at landscape design. But after all, the pieces we have now are hugely popular. Why reinvent the wheel? Phil objected. That's the thing. It's like an artist or a musician. I want to create something new. I'd like to create gardens that are not an extension of the house but an extension of the person. Bruce was a very talented landscape designer. Even in college. He was expected to be successful. The guy put forward such bold ideas that it was simply impossible to remain indifferent to them. Some admired them. Some criticized them. But there was not a single person who would remain indifferent. After graduating from college, Bruce organized his own business. He met Phil while he was still studying. Phil didn't have as much talent. But his organizational skills helped Bruce out more than once. And he deservedly took the position of deputy head of their company. Bruce and his team had already completed many gardens and were sought after by wealthy people in the country. A month ago, he was approached by an obscenely wealthy man. He was willing to pay a substantial amount of money because his wife, Joanna, wanted to create an extraordinary garden in their mansion in the south of the country. Phil, with your trends, you'll just push him away. Phil said with annoyance in his voice. Think twice because we could make so much money from him. I have a feeling they understand me. The director persisted. My intuition never fails me. After finishing work at the office, Bruce drove home. Daddy's here. A boy of about seven and a little girl rejoiced and rushed to meet him. The man tossed the girl into the air, kissed her tenderly, and lifted the boy into his arms. So, what have you been up to today while I was at work? The father asked with interest. The children began to recount their adventures. Today, they had built a small house in the branches of the trees. The gardener, Mr. Selak, helped them with that. Bruce was delighted and laughing, asked the children to show him their creation. The children grabbed him by the hand and led him into a small grove. Wow! Said Bruce with delight. What a beautiful house. Really? You guys did such a great job. Okay. I have to take a picture of it. Bruce always found time to watch his children. They motivated him and inspired him. The boy was bold in his ideas and strongly resembled his father. Little Bonnie liked to play more and never took anything too seriously. Then the man walked into the house. His wife, Sandra, was discussing something animatedly on the phone. When she saw her husband, she immediately hung up. Hello. Darling. Are you home already? She asked in surprise. You're early today. Did something happen to you? Uh. No. Bruce replied tiredly. I got that South project on my mind. I think about it all the time. Yes. We're so lucky that this rich man is interested in you. His wife kissed him on the cheek. The main thing now is not to miss this chance. Sandra. I want to offer him something new. I think it will help me realize my dream too. Bruce looked her in the eyes. Bruce. You can't stop already. Sandra said sternly. You and your concepts will drive him crazy. And he will refuse to hire you. I'm even afraid to think about how much money we would lose then. Sandra. 
It's not only about money. Bruce said with annoyance in his voice. The main thing is to constantly grow. To develop. I don't want to offer anyone any more lifeless forms. You know. Bruce. I understand that you have talent. Sandra replied grudgingly. But everything needs a balance. If not for money. Then what are you working for? This was the greatest pain for Bruce. His wife had never understood him. Or rather. She initially supported him in everything. But when he became rich. It was as if she lost all interest in him. For the last five years. Sandra had been living her own life. It was around one o'clock in the morning when the man went out into the garden. It was July. And the crickets were singing joyfully. Fireflies flickered in the grass. Resembling candle flames. Everything here is alive at any moment. Admired Bruce. But do I only need this moment? It's so fleeting. What comes next? He pondered aloud. Bruce was about to head towards the house when a gentle breeze came. Causing the leaves to whisper in the treetops and the grass to sway like waves in constant movement. The man suddenly exclaimed. It's not just the moment. Not now. But constant movement that is important. This was what he had been searching for. As the saying goes. Everything in genius is simple and lies on the surface. Now I know what I will show to them. Bruce happily told his friend. Phil. The next day. I found it, movement. Phil looked at him bewildered and reproachful. He had never delved deeply into his friend's philosophical musings. It all seemed boring to him. Two days later. The rich clients arrived. The whole office was abuzz with excitement. They needed to prepare for the arrival of such an important guest. Organize a proper lunch. And give the client and his wife a city tour. But Bruce was more concerned with correctly conveying his idea to them. His entire desk was covered in sketches. Including graphics. Pastels. And watercolors. The designer wanted to express his vision of the garden. Through handmade sketches and then explain. Everything in detail on the day of the arrival. Bruce and Phil personally drove to the airport to greet the guests. The airport meeting went well. And within an hour and a half. Everyone was already at the office. The Goldberg couple had other plans in the city. Which they intended to do after their meeting with Bruce. Therefore. It was necessary for the owner of the landscaping company to captivate the couple with his ideas in just one day and convince them to collaborate with him well said mr goldberg we would like to hear your opinion about our land and your ideas and what can be done with it bruce was immediately responsive i won't lie to you when i saw this place i knew right away that it shouldn't be something conventional I want to move away from the usual concept of a garden, with its emphasis on regularity and balance, and instead capture its very essence. Mr. Goldberg looked at him puzzled. But Joanna's eyes lit up at Bruce's words. And what will that consist of? The woman asked with interest. Your garden will become, as it were, your extension, calmly declared the designer. I know it may sound abstract. But it is not. Throughout the centuries. Gardens have served various functions. They became symbols of power during the Renaissance. And in the Baroque era. We saw passion gardens. The 19th century cannot be imagined without the classical English garden. But ultimately. They all aim to convey the same thing. At the core of these magnificent creations was the moment of the eternal now. And in my opinion. That concept is outdated. I understand your point. Joanna supported Bruce. But isn't that what matters? No. Bruce replied. 
the most important thing is the never-ending movement. It may not have a defined form. But it is smooth and uninterrupted. The garden must become a river. It must start to flow. You become its center. And when you step into it, you should feel the vibration of life and realize that it is in you. First of all, Mrs. Goldberg was absolutely thrilled, while her husband couldn't grasp the point at all. However, the woman was practically bouncing in her chair with joy. But how can we make it happen? She asked curiously, well still have all the same materials. Bruce said with a smile, but we'll use them differently this time. For example, we won't have any trim trees and bushes. Our bushes will have thin branches so that they can easily convey movement. Of course, none of this will grow haphazardly. Each plant will have its own place to convey the idea that everything is constantly changing and growing. Everything will move from one state to another in a smooth and balanced way. But all of this only comes into play when you enter your garden. You don't just walk past the rose garden. You become the roses. I.D. also like to add not only a vertical element but a horizontal element as well. For example, a Japanese pine tree that grows horizontally. You realize that even in a horizontal direction, there can be growth. It's not a static hedge that keeps getting trimmed all the time. The pine grows the way it wants. You just guide it a little bit. You want to put a pine tree horizontally. Mr. Goldberg asked incredulously. Yes. And not only that. Replied the designer boldly. It could be an alternative to the hedges. That are constantly being trimmed. And I.D. also like to add a pond. Water is a balance. But. As you know. In both Rome and Versailles. A huge pond was the center of the garden. But here. We don't need to demonstrate might and power. We need to reflect your individuality. In the smoothness of the lake, you enter your garden. And as you walk along the paths, you gradually become one with it. Finally, when you reach the lake, you look into it and realize that you are not separate from your garden. That it is the water and the trees that are you. You know, on the one hand, what you're saying is very similar to Asian gardens. Joanna said. But when I visualize it. All I can say with full confidence is that it is something entirely new. You don't just want to go from form to content. It's as if you're blurring the line between the two. I'm sorry. I can't put it into words what I'm experiencing right now. But I can clearly feel what you're talking about. Bruce. I would very much like to cooperate with you. Mr. Goldberg didn't really understand the whole garden thing. But he relied entirely on his wife in the matter. As the Goldberg couple departed, Bruce sighed happily and opened a bottle of champagne. Well, let's drink to us and our future success. He raised his glass. He raced to a new direction. To innovative ideas. To be honest. As soon as you started philosophizing, I thought we were in for a real failure. Phil grinned. Yes. If it weren't for his wife. He would certainly disagree with me. Bruce sighed. And they'd find some modern designer to offer. The old ones under a new source. A week later. Bruce and the other two designers traveled to Mr. Goldberg's mansion. It was an old ranch. And after buying it, Mr. Goldberg didn't know what to do with it. That's why Joanna suggested a huge garden on 10 acres. The woman realized that it would support her husband's reputation and raise his ratings in his future political career. Paul. Joanna said, our garden can become a real gem here among the preserves and forests. Well create something wholly new. A Paul Goldberg garden. 
for almost two weeks. Bruce and his team did the work. They found all the necessary maps. Checked the soil and groundwater. Studied the local climate and the peculiarities of the season. They studied the local plants and recorded their species. All of this could be called more of a scientific expedition. Bruce understood the responsibility it involved. Millions of dollars were at stake. So it was necessary to take into account everything. So that the project was carried out as he conceived it. One evening, Bruce received a call from his wife. The children missed their father very much and wanted to talk to him. Well. How are you? Sandra asked. Taking the phone after the children. How are you doing there? You know. Sandra. There is a lot of work. Replied her husband. It's a very long-term contract we're talking about. Three years and a lot of money. That's good. The woman replied cheerfully. Maybe we'll move there too if you make good money on this project. We could buy a bigger house there. It's so warm there. Not like here. Well see. Dear. Sighed the tired husband. After five minutes of talking. He walked out of the house and looked towards the mountains. The surroundings were beautiful. With the sun almost setting and colored shadows spreading across the plain. I thought that when I got this project. I'd be happy. Bruce thought. But here. I miss my beloved woman and children so much. Sandra hasn't shown any interest in me for a long time. I just live with her for the sake of the children. How much longer will it be enough? Bruce realized that if it weren't for his work. In which he was completely immersed. He would no longer be able to ignore the way his wife treated him. When he met Sandra. He thought he had found everlasting happiness. But as soon as he had more money. She changed. She developed an inflated sense of dignity. And gradually grew colder towards Bruce. After the birth of their daughter. Sandra rarely looked in his direction with love. Meanwhile. His wife was having a conversation with another man. I'm so afraid that idiot will lose such a project. Sandra said angrily into the receiver. Don't worry so much. The male voice laughed. The main thing is that now we can be together for a couple of weeks. Well. Come to my place. I'm waiting for you. I'll be there in an hour. Said Bruce's wife to her lover coquettishly. How I've missed you all this time. I'm so sick of all this. Sandra. My love. Just bear a little more. Everything will be fine soon. Sandra put on a beautiful dress. Let her hair down. Applied some foundation on her face. And painted her eyelashes. She looked gorgeous. Before leaving. The woman looked into the children's room. Where her children were playing with the nanny. She kissed them and assured them she would be back soon. Then she got into her car and left. Sandra had been having an affair for many years. She had long wanted to divorce Bruce. But on one hand. She was afraid of losing everything she had. On the other hand. She was waiting for the right opportunity to tell Bruce everything. There was another important circumstance that prevented. Sandra from divorcing her husband. The girl Bonnie was not Bruce's daughter. She had given birth to her from her lover. Therefore. She was afraid that in the divorce. Bruce could take a principled stance and deprive her of everything. The car pulled up to a multi-story house. And in ten minutes. She was already opening the lover's apartment with her key. Hello. The man came out to meet her. What took you so long? How I've missed you all this time. Then he picked up Sandra in his arms and carried her to his bedroom. Bruce and his team had completed all the necessary front work. Now they needed to discuss everything with the customer. Bruce and Joanna greeted them. Unfortunately. 
My husband is very busy. And he apologizes for that. So I will probably be working on the garden with you myself. In fact. Bruce was happy about it because Joanna understood. What he was talking about and naturally helped him with his work. Joanna listened attentively to what the designer was telling her. They discussed all the details. Subtleties. And nuances. And then signed the contract. Mrs. Goldberg wrote Bruce the first check for a very impressive sum. The contract required him to fly here every two months. To check on the progress of the work. Next time. We should select the plants that will be needed. Bruce thought as he flew home on the airplane. I've already found recumbent pines. So he'll need to look for some more flowering trees. The children greeted their father happily. The girl didn't leave his side that day. And the son talked non-stop about what they had been. Doing all the time without their father. Sandra was also quite delighted with her husband's fees. However. When Bruce was left alone with her in the evening. She again kept aloof and cold. Sandra. Don't you have any feelings for me? He asked. His voice filled with vexation. His wife didn't answer him and, citing a headache, went to her room. Fall quickly flew by, and the new year was approaching. The project was progressing well, and Joanna enjoyed everything about it, feeling that Bruce understood her on a deeper level. However, they both knew they had to remain realistic and accept that not everything they planned would be possible. Despite this, the garden owner spared no expense and was eager to explore new and incredible experiments. As New Year's Eve approached, Phil asked Bruce, So when are you leaving next time? Things seem to be going well. Yes. Bruce smiled. Joanna is truly passionate about her garden. She is determined to see it come to life. Not only is she willing to invest money, but she is also patient. I never thought these wealthy people would go for it. Phil said arrogantly. They're usually very cautious and hesitant to spend any extra money. But here. We have such generosity. Why don't we sell her something else since she's already so loyal? Phil. What are you talking about? Bruce replied in shock. She is already paying us more than we need. Well. If I were you, I wouldn't miss the opportunity. Phil winked at Bruce. In our company, we have always worked and will continue to work honestly. Bruce stated firmly. We will never deceive our clients. Phil left Bruce's office unhappily. While Bruce glanced at his watch and hurried off to an important meeting. Along the way, he stopped at a flower store. Took a deep breath enjoying the fragrance of white roses and thought her favorites a symbol of our love and the approaching new year no a symbol of new beginnings we will start anew meanwhile phil also went to a meeting but it was with his lover he greeted her warmly in a small cafe on the outskirts of town hello sandra how glad I am to see you. A few years after Bruce married her, Sandra began a passionate affair with Phil. The woman contemplated leaving her husband but decided to wait. When she discovered she was pregnant, she was also afraid of losing her promising husband. As for Phil, it was all a game and a form of revenge. Back in college, he had been jealous of Bruce's talents. Phil, on the other hand, was just an ordinary guy who didn't excel academically. However, when Bruce mentioned his plans to start his own company in their final year, Phil started to befriend him. Bruce believed he needed at least one trustworthy person to help him establish the company. So he chose Phil for that role. Little did Bruce know that Phil had ulterior motives. 
to gain his trust and once he became wealthy betray him and that's exactly what phil had been doing all these years when bruce married the beautiful sandra phil's envy intensified he wanted to take everything away from bruce to feel superior rather than living in his shadow phil didn't have to try hard to seduce sandra so for over four years sandra and phil engaged in a secret affair what did you find out from him sandra asked impatiently unfortunately sandra he won't agree to it phil replied sadly and if i were to do it myself i would be caught immediately phil what are we going to do now sandra pleaded i can't continue living like this with him i had so much hope that you could make money from this project and we could live together maybe even go to europe or to the south of the country what do we do now why don't you trick him into signing some documents let him transfer a large sum of money to your account and then we can leave right away sandra it's not so easy sighed the man bruce scrutinizes every document that concerns this joanna there's nothing to be done here how should we get rid of him then sandra said impatiently after all you promised me we'd be out of here after new years well if i promised then he'll do it he replied grudgingly i have an idea but i need to thoroughly think about all the details bruce and his wife decided to celebrate new year's eve at home his parents died long ago so he had no close relatives sandra's parents lived in a remote town a thousand kilometers away from them so they could not come to visit come to my place after new years suggested phil anyway he'll have nothing to do alone phil when will you get married bruce joked are you going to be a bachelor for the rest of your life don't worry he'll get married soon you'll soon see for yourself grinned phil when are you going to introduce your fiance to me and sandra bruce was surprised who is she you haven't told me anything about her when the time comes you'll find out all about it yourself phil said mysteriously well he'll be waiting for you on january 2nd then okay agreed bruce and hung up the phone he tried to stay out of his friend's personal life so he especially did not ask him about his women when they were young Phil sometimes told him about his love adventures. Still, after Bruce got married, he stopped discussing such topics with him. Then Christmas came. The children were eagerly unwrapping presents under the tree. And this is for you. My love. Bruce handed his wife the keys to a new car. Sandra grabbed the keys and ran out into the yard. There was an expensive red car. The woman looked at it in shock. She was in real rapture. Thank you. Bruce. God. I've been dreaming of it for so long. It is simply peerless. Cried Sandra in admiration. Bruce wanted to use this gift to strengthen his relationship with his wife. But once again. He did not succeed. Sandra. Despite the gift remained cold like a rock. Bruce. Did she like the car? Asked Phil. Calling his friend a few days later. Yes. Very much. Replied Bruce. She was dancing with happiness in front of it. Well. I told you this would be the best present for her. Laughed Phil. Good thing you listened to me. Yes. Yes. His friend answered without much cheer. The main thing is that she liked it. Oh. By the way. You can come a day early. Well spend an evening together. Discuss plans for the next year. 
and you'll just have a break from your wife and children. And Sandra will come with the kids the next day. Phil suggested after New Year's Eve. Bruce, as it had been decided before, came to Phil in the evening in his car. And Sandra and the children arrived only on the next day. Bringing gifts for Uncle Phil. Eddie. Bonnie. Phil opened his arms. Welcoming. Well. Children. Happy New Year. The children happily rushed to him. The man grabbed the girl and hugged her tightly. Half an hour later. Everyone was sitting at a richly set table. Well. Come on. Tell me. How is our Joanna? Phil asked after dinner. Did you wish her a happy new year? Yes. I've caught her. Bruce answered. We exchanged pleasantries. She assured me once again that she would not. Part with us until we finish her garden. Well. That's good. Phil laughed. Yes. If everything goes according to plan. It will truly be a magical garden. Bruce sighed dreamily. I have calculated every little detail in the project. I have a growth process scheduled for each tree. But that's only in the first few years. After which the garden will begin to live its own life. I can't even describe how I feel when I visualize it in my head. A garden is like a garden, his deputy calmly stated. Although no one before you planned gardens like this. And no one introduced horizontal elements in this way. So it will certainly be different from all the others. You are right about that. By the way. Do you want to move down south with your family for the project? And I could stay here to take care of business. Joanna said she's willing to pay for a place for me and my family to live. But I haven't decided to do that yet. Bruce sighed. There are some serious projects going on here too. So I'd probably rather stay here for now. Well. That's up to you. Phil replied indifferently. Do as you see fit. Well. It'll probably go with the kids home. It's getting snowy. Happy New Year. Phil. Sandra said and stood up. Yeah. And he'll go with you. Bruce. Got up from the couch. I've got more work to do today. Bruce. What a fool I am. I forgot about my present to you. Phil laughed. Please stay for a while. Your business won't go anywhere. And I have something special for you. Reluctantly. Bruce agreed. The men walked Sandra and the children to the car. Yes. It's a nice car. Phil whistled. I can imagine how much money you gave for it. My wife is worth much more. Replied Bruce. Sandra deserves the best. The woman smiled dryly. Thanked him for the compliment. And getting into the car. Immediately drove away. Well. Bruce. Let's go. Phil tugged his friend. The men entered the house and went up to the second floor. Phil led his friend into his study. The room had a small window that faced the opposite side. They talked about life for about half an hour. When Phil suddenly stood up and took out a book from the bedside table. Bruce took it carefully. Wow. He said excitedly. The book of André Le Notre. The Gardener of the Sun King. Louis the Sixteenth. Where did you get it? It's unbelievable. That's the foundation of the whole landscape design. The man looked at the diagrams and sketches with pleasure. Although the book was written in French. The language of design is universal. Yes. The French is translated. Phil explained. So they got ahead in the design ages. Do you like it? Phil asked. This is my gift to you. Phil insisted. Bruce hesitated. Saying. You shouldn't. Phil. It's such a rarity. 
you can't buy such a book anywhere. Now. My dear friend. Take it from the bottom of my heart. Phil patted Bruce on the shoulder. But what about something to drink, Phil? Bruce asked. Thank you very much. But I have to go already. Bruce said. Impressed by the gift. And they promised heavy snow today. And it's already icy outside. All right. Phil agreed. Then he'll see you in a week. I hope you'll get some rest before then. I'd like to hope so too. Bruce sighed. There's work to be done. The men said their goodbyes. And Bruce got into his car. The gate automatically swung open. And he drove onto the street. Be careful on the road. There's heavy ice. Phil warned him as a farewell. Bruce waved him off and, turning on the wipers, drove carefully towards the road. Come on. Cursed the man. There is not only ice on the road but also the snow like a wall. I should have gone straight after Sandra. Okay. He'll get on the highway. Then he'll add some speed. I need to go home quickly. Ten minutes later. The man was already on the highway. It was snowing so heavily that it was. Almost impossible to see anything. Bruce felt that there was no ice on the highway. Because of the chemicals and increased the speed a little. He had passed the straight part of the road. But now there were several difficult turns. Before the first turn. Bruce tried to slow down. But the car continued as if nothing had happened. The man became nervous and started to hit the brakes. But nothing changed. The car drove onto the elevated part of the turn. And from there, it simply flew down into the ravine at full speed. Feeling the strong impact. Bruce immediately lost consciousness. He didn't know how long he was unconscious. But at some point. He heard a voice above him. He came to his senses when Bruce managed to open his eyes. Everything in front of him was blurry. And after a few minutes. His vision began to focus. He noticed the drip. He couldn't move. And his head wouldn't turn either. You've been here for a long time. The doctor told him. I'm sorry. But we can't provide any prognosis. You'll live. But the question is how? What happened to me? Bruce tried to ask. I remember my car flipping over. Unfortunately. There were many accidents that day. The doctor said. You weren't the only unlucky one. Several people lost their lives due to the ice. My brakes didn't work. Bruce tried to explain. That's why I lost control of the car because of the icy conditions. The car can't break on a surface like that. The doctor clarified. Bruce wanted to say more. But he remained silent helplessly. He needed to conserve his strength. He remembered Sandra visiting him a few times. But he couldn't speak at the time. Finally. The day came when Bruce could talk to her. Hi. Bruce. Sandra said seriously and slightly cold. You frightened us all. Phil also wanted to come to see you. But no one else is allowed yet except for me. How are the children? The man asked quietly. I wish I could hug them. Sandra. I miss them so much. They're doing well. Replied his wife. They miss you too. I'm sorry. But I'm afraid to bring them in just yet. I understand said her husband. How about work? Has anyone informed Joanna? That I'm currently in the hospital. He'll be out soon and can continue working. Bruce. Sandra said cautiously. You need to know that your career is over. You won't be able to walk again. Bruce stared at her in shock. After a moment. Tears spilled from his eyes. How could this have happened? I couldn't calm down. My God. 
Is it really true? Yes. The woman replied briefly. Your spine is seriously damaged. A few days later. Phil also came to see Bruce. He was greatly concerned. Bruce. I'm sorry. It's all my fault. He wept. I insisted that you stay with me longer. What's it got to do with you? Bruce replied sharply. Did you ice the road and pile up snow? I'm not sure. But I had the feeling that my brakes were failing. Phil replied calmly. And then the cop said that with this kind of ice. It happens. Phil. What am I supposed to do now? Bruce whispered in shock. I don't know. Friend. Phil smiled. Maybe you'll be able to get up. Then you'll get back to your business. Would you mind signing some papers? Only now did it come to Bruce that he could no longer work. He sobbed quietly. Phil gave him water and held out a pen. Bruce signed all the documents without complaint. If you want to sell your business. He'll buy it from you. Phil said. Goodbye. Bruce. You'll need a lot of money for treatment. After Phil left. Bruce fell into a deep depression. He did not want to see anyone. Three months later. He was discharged and brought home in a wheelchair. The only ones who were still happy to see him were his children. Bruce. I can't go on like this. Sandra sobbed a week later. How are we going to live like this? You have no job. And soon we'll run out of money. I'm sorry. I didn't want to tell you. But your company is bankrupt. Bruce said in horror. How could it be? It's only June now. It's not like I've been absent for years. Phil didn't tell me anything about this. He just didn't want to upset you. Sandra sighed. They were all focused on the Joanna project. So. There was no one to do the rest of the business. You were out of time on two big projects. And the customers are asking for a refund and moral damages. Phil will come today and tell you everything. In the evening. Phil came into Bruce's bedroom with a sad face. It was obvious that things were really going badly. Phil. What's going on? Bruce shouted in anger. Have you ruined our firm? Calm down. Said his deputy calmly. I will pay you 20% of the cost of your company. I'm sorry. But with company debts like that. I can't offer you more. As for Joanna. She's willing to work with me. All right. Bruce replied coldly. But on what grounds do you use my project to work with Joanna? That's not just copyright infringement. Phil. That's theft. Phil stood up calmly and took a folder out of his briefcase. Holding it out to Bruce. Bruce. I'm sorry. But Joanna changed her mind. When you went into the hospital. She asked me to change the project. Because her husband and she changed their minds. But we'd already done so much work to change the landscape. Bruce couldn't believe it. With their money. They can do anything. Phil sighed. Today they're digging holes and removing soil. And tomorrow they're building hills. Bruce burst into tears. I've lost everything. That's why I want to help you. Friend. Phil hugged him. I offer you a good sum of money to buy out your company. Bruce agreed and signed all the documents. The next day. Another week later. His wife came into his room. Bruce. I'm sorry. But we're leaving. She said calmly. You're a grown man. And you realize that I need to feed my children. But I have enough money for five to seven years. The man begged her to stay. Sandra. I can't live without the children. I beg you. Stay. Bruce. You are an egotist. Shouted Sandra. 
at least think about our children. You already have someone. Bruce's eyes filled with blood. I'm asking you. Answer me. Did you really think I was going to sit here for the rest of my life? Rotting away with you? Look at you. You mean. When I wasn't disabled and had money. Everything suited you. Bruce shouted angrily. Get out of here. You're just a corrupt wretch. From that day on. It was as if something had broken in Bruce. He turned into a creepy. Grumbling creature. The man constantly yelled at the workers of the house. Those who had worked for him for a long time simply. Did not understand what was happening to him. I hate it. Shouted the owner late at night in his bed. I hate everyone. God. If you had a single drop of pity for me. I beg you. Stop all this. But it was as if the heavens did not hear him. And every day. The pain grew worse. Bruce didn't know how to deal with it and poured. All his anger onto the remnants of his staff. What is this? He looked angrily at the cook. I'm not eating this. Do you think that just because I'm disabled? I've become a pig? He shouted at the top of his voice. Angrily throwing the plate from the table to the floor. Then went in his wheelchair to his study. He began to dump all his documents, projects, and books on the floor with hatred. I hate all of you. I hate this house. I hate myself. He shouted in rage. More than once. Bruce thought of doing something bad to himself. But there was a rod inside him that wouldn't let him bend. The pain was so unbearable that he thought he was going mad. So. About a month passed. And people who worked for him were gradually dismissed. Only one gardener remained. Bruce. The elderly man stroked his master's head. You are a kind guy. There is no evil inside you except what has happened. And life will surely show you the way out. You. Like any genius. Are a hypersensitive person. But if you look at things differently. Everything will change. Terry packed her bag with trembling hands. How many times had the woman imagined. That the day would come. When the prison gates would open in front of her. And she would finally be free. However. When that day arrived. Terry felt no emotions. Only a strong shiver running through her. The woman stepped out of the cell. Separated by several doors from her new life. Her heart pounded frantically in her chest. As the prison gates closed behind her. She hesitated for a moment. Then clenched her fists and walked forward quickly. Thinking. I'm never coming back here again. The words pounded in her temples. God. Can you hear me? Never. Terry had spent her entire life with her grandparents in a small village. She met her fiancé. Adam. At the age of 20. Her grandfather was still alive. However. Within a year of their marriage. He passed away. And the young couple decided to sell his house. Adam added some money. And they purchased a nice dwelling in a nearby larger settlement. The first two years Terry and Adam lived well. But over time. Adam began to drink and go out. Soon after. He found himself in an unpleasant situation. Where he was framed and demanded a large sum of money. Both Adam and Terry started thinking about. How they could escape from this situation. Adam borrowed a large sum of money from several friends. And they decided to go to the capital to earn money. To pay off the debt as soon as possible. Terry and her husband found jobs at a large warehouse. And worked together for almost a year. They managed to pay off part of their debt. And then Adam said that he was offered a job in their town and soon left. Terry continued working as a packer in the warehouse. After another six months. 
the couple finally paid off all their debts. And Terry was ready to return home. However, one day her neighbor revealed a shocking truth to her. Terry, I apologize for meddling in your business. But your husband has been living with Kelly for a long time. And she is pregnant with his child. Terry felt as if she had been hit with boiling water. Her heart raced as she called her husband. Terry. You're a grown woman. Adam calmly replied. I no longer want to live with you. I have a new family now. Leave me alone. So you used me to buy a house and pay off our debts. And now you want to abandon me? Terry scolded. Then give me back all the money I earned. What money? Her husband cynically laughed. Did I ever force you to do anything? It didn't take long for Terry to find out. That Adam never had any debts. He had simply invented this story to take. Ownership of all the money she had earned. Thinking only of her situation. Terry decided to stay in the city for the moment. And earn money for a lawyer to sue for division of property. She continued to work in the warehouse. But there was a strange employee named Durit who made her uncomfortable. He would look at Terry with a sneaky and unsettling gaze. She became afraid of him. At first, Terry tried to ignore him, but she soon realized that he was constantly lurking around her. What does he want from me? She thought. Just his presence fills me with fear. One day, during the night shift, Terry's mood immediately sank. It was already about three o'clock when she went out to the toilet. Suddenly, she heard someone coming. It was Durit. Terry herself did not know how she got away from him. The restroom was on the other side of the workplace. She needed to reach the central part. Then go down to the first floor through an open staircase. And finally, run down the corridor to be among people. Terry rushed forward with all her might. But on the stairs, Dermot caught her. The girl screamed loudly. The man grabbed Terry and tried to drag her upstairs. But she somehow twisted and pushed him with all her strength. He couldn't hold on and fell down. The distance to the first floor was short. And he probably wouldn't have been hurt so badly. If there hadn't been a platform with prongs at the bottom. Unfortunately, Dermot ran into one of them. The court considered that Terry defended herself. But since the man died, she was given a sentence. The girl's investigator directly told her that if she paid him money, she would not be put in jail. Adam, I beg you, pay me a share of our house. Terry pleaded with her ex-husband. I could go to jail. Terry, what share are you talking about? He asked annoyed. Each of us has been living our own lives for a long time. What you did there is none of my business. Don't call me again. So Terry ended up in jail. After serving her sentence, she went to the Department for Social Protection and Rehabilitation of Prisoners. A room in the dormitory and a place at the factory. That's all we can offer you. The employee said sternly. Terry nodded sadly and wandered to the specified address. It was April. And it was still cold. The woman wrapped herself in her old jacket and cried. It is so unfair. First. I had been working for my husband like a slave. Then I went to jail for nothing. Did I want to hurt him? She thought. But if he had gotten his way he might have gone to jail. Everyone would have pretended it was no big deal. In their opinion, I should have just let him do whatever he wanted to me and kept quiet. Finally, Terry sighed and opened the door to her room. The rest of the evening, Terry cleaned it. Finally, she took a shower and went to bed. But in the middle of the night, she was awakened by some noise. The neighbors on the floors were cheerfully celebrating something. They didn't care about anyone. 
screaming at the top of their lungs. Welcome to freedom. Terry muttered. Wrapped herself in a blanket. And tried to sleep. The dormitory was a troubled place. No one kept track of what was going on there or who was bringing others to their rooms. As soon as I earn some money, I'll get an apartment. Terry dreamed. A few days later, she visited the factory. The conditions there were no better than in her dormitory. And the wages for hard physical labor were very low. Most of the workers there were former prisoners like her. How am I supposed to live on that? The woman angrily asked. They don't consider us human beings at all. Terry started working at the factory. And in her spare time. She tried to find another job. She made calls. But because of her criminal record. No one wanted to hire her. Terry became more and more depressed. Why do I need such a life? Thought the woman. It's better to just lie down and die. Terry lay down for several days in her room. After five days. Her body began to beg for food so urgently. That she could not bear it and got up. Staggering. She wandered through the streets and finally found herself. In a park where she sat down on a bench and wept bitterly. And this too shall pass. She heard someone's voice. It's all just a moment in the endless time of life. Terry looked at the strange elderly person sitting next to her. Do you think that if everyone rejects me today, then tomorrow they will change and accept me? Why would you wait to be accepted? The stranger looked at her carefully. Right now. Start accepting yourself. Do you live for others' opinions or to be true to yourself? It's your life. And only you have the right to do something with it. Others can't influence you. You're probably right. But I still have to feed myself. I need a roof over my head. And I don't have any money. They won't hire me for a regular job. Terry told her story to the stranger. You know. I have a good friend. Replied the old man. He is a very kind man. But like you. He has faced unpleasant events in his life and is currently in a deep crisis. You could help each other. I agree. But only if he pays me for my work. Terry rejoiced. I can do everything around the house. I've never stolen anything from anyone. I'm a reliable person. My name is Mr. Selig. The stranger held out his hand. I'll talk to him today. And I'll meet you here at the same time tomorrow. The old man stood up and wandered towards the bus stop. An hour later. He arrived at the gate of a big house. Bruce. Sunny. Good afternoon. The gardener greeted the owner. Who was sitting in his wheelchair on the terrace. How are you doing? Hello. The man replied. I'm the same today as yesterday. Bruce. You know that I love you like a son. The old man began the conversation. But I'm getting old. And I can't take care of you anymore. I only have enough strength left to do some gardening. Son. You need someone to take care of you and the house. I don't want to see anyone. You know that. The man replied dryly. Bruce. You won't go to the grave alone. Al the gardener looked at him sternly. And if God has left you alive. Then you are needed here for something. Humble your pride and accept it. Were all the great masters healthy? When Beethoven composed his Ninth Symphony. He was practically deaf. Sonny. It's time to start living again. Bruce looked at the old man carefully. Mr. Selick was the only person who truly loved him. He had been with him in both wealth and poverty. He didn't even take money for tending the garden. All right. Bruce answered at last. But I don't know where I can find a good person. That's okay. It'll help you. Mr. Selick smiled. 
There is a woman I have in mind. But she has faced the same big trouble as you. They put her in jail for nothing. You want an ex-convict in my house? Bruce said in shock. She's as pure as the first snow. Replied Mr. Selig. Trust me. I know people. It's just that she has been unlucky in life. Like you. She was abandoned by everyone. That's right. Bruce sighed. You were right about Sandra. And in the end. It turned out just as you said. Sandra is in the past. The gardener patted Bruce on the shoulder. You need to move on with your life. All right. Have your protege come tomorrow. For your sake. He'll try. Replied the master sadly. No. Bruce. It's time to do something for your own sake. Mr. Selig looked him straight in the eye. Good afternoon. Terry said to Mr. Selig with a smile the next day. Are you ready to start a new life? Be patient. Bruce is not in the best shape now. But when he comes to his senses, you will become true friends. You see, he's like a son to me. And what can a father wish for his child? Only one thing, happiness. Terry felt extremely nervous throughout the entire way. She realized that this meeting could potentially change everything in her life. Well, here we are. The gardener opened the gate of the large house. Bruce. Meet the guest. A man with a stern look appeared on the porch. And scrutinized the woman from head to toe. Can you handle household tasks? He asked dryly. Cleaning. Cooking. Ironing. Yes. Terry replied quietly. I used to have my own house. And I took care of everything myself. Why don't you have it anymore? Bruce asked with interest. Did something happen to it? My ex-husband took it away from me. And he now lives there with his new wife. Terry replied. All right. My name is Bruce. I am the owner of this house. I used to have a family too. A wife and children. However. When I became disabled. My wife left me for another man. I've shared my story with you. And I hope you won't inquire further about it. Okay. Terry nodded. I understand. I won't pry into your personal life and ask about your past anymore. From the first few days. Terry could sense that Bruce would not be easy to work with. It wasn't that he bothered her or distrusted her. But he was always dissatisfied with something. Whether it was the soup being too salty. The shirt not properly ironed. Or streaks left on the floor after cleaning. Be patient. Terry. Mr. Selig encouraged her. He's not angry with you but with his ex-wife. He's frustrated with life. Feeling abandoned by his friend. If you can understand that. It might help you feel better. Terry herself began to see Bruce's openness and kindness. Even though he tried his best to conceal these qualities from others. Mr. Selig has trimmed the pine tree. I took some branches for a bouquet, said Terry one day. Oh. Bring it here. Bruce requested. I'm curious to see it. The woman brought a bouquet of pine branches. And white roses and handed it to him. He examined it carefully. Why white roses? He asked Terry with interest. Why didn't you include any red ones? I believe that combining the pine tree with. White roses creates a bouquet that represents nobility and purity. Terry explained. Bruce gazed at her intently. Then shifted his attention to the bouquet. Terry. Please bring me an album and watercolors from my table. He said finally. I want to sketch it. An hour later. Terry was examining the sketches. 
one of them depicted a pine tree adorned with white roses. While another showed towering rocks resembling cliffs. With white roses weaving through them. The roses didn't completely cover the rocks. But their shoots on the sides greatly expanded the space. Very beautiful. The woman exclaimed. Unable to contain her admiration. Now I can clearly see what I wanted to tell you. You have a great sense of the essence and content of things. Bruce initially smiled. But then. As if suddenly awakening. He angrily snatched his drawings from Terry's hands and tore them up. It's all nonsense. He shouted in anger. Take your bouquet away from here and leave me alone. He quickly turned his wheelchair and made his way back to his room. The housekeeper gathered the torn drawings. She was hurt by Bruce's behavior. But she felt even more sorrowful for him. She had heard from Mr. Selick on multiple occasions that Bruce had a true talent. But he rejected any attempt to regain his former self. Terry worked for her new employer every day. Except on Sundays. It took her nearly a week to organize the house. But now things were much easier. She even had some spare time and began to assist the gardener. Almost a month had passed. And Bruce still spoke to Terry through gritted teeth. And only when it concerned business matters. Then one day. Bruce approached her. Terry. Would you mind accompanying me on my walk? He said coldly. I would like to go down the street. All right. The housekeeper replied. They'll just take off my apron. They walked in silence along the deserted street. Suddenly. Terry heard the sound of someone crying. Is it a bird crying? The woman asked aloud. Or maybe a cat meowing. Wait a minute. He'll take a look. Terry reached into the bushes and saw a puppy stuck in the fence. After about five minutes. The woman finally managed to pull it out. The dog wagged its tail cheerfully and rushed to its saviors. Hey. Buddy. Are you going to follow us like this? Bruce asked. Where is your home? He is homeless. Apparently. Terry replied with vexation in her voice and looked hopefully at Bruce. Shouldn't we take him in? The man was about to angrily say no but instead laughed. To Terry's surprise. Why not? Maybe he can learn to bring my slippers to me. Bruce's smile transformed him. And Terry's breath caught with joy. It was the first time she had seen his true face. All the way back. They discussed merrily what to name their pet. And what to do with him. Your Rex is a real bully. The gardener said grudgingly the next morning. He dug up all my strawberries. I feel Rex is going to cause us many troubles. He probably thinks he's the boss now. Sighed Terry. She had just come into the house to say hello to Bruce. But he was not in a good mood this morning. What's wrong with him? She whispered through her tears. Yesterday. Everything was fine. We had such a fun walk. The dog was saved. And we were happy. And today. He's sitting like a black cloud again. The mood swings of the owner exhausted Terry. In fact. Despite all this, Terry liked Bruce very much. And she dreamed of becoming friends with him. Somehow. She wanted to talk to him about many things. She admired what he did when she cleaned his study. The woman often leafed through his scrapbook. Enjoying his projects and ideas. It was as if she could feel what he wanted to convey in his work. And that drew her to him strongly. Summer was over. And it was September. Terry had wanted to leave so many times, but every time she approached Bruce to tell him that she was quitting. Something happened inside her. Terry clearly felt that she wanted to stay. One day. Bruce asked her to take a walk down the street with him. And Rex accompanied them. As usual. One must give Mr. 
Selig credit. He had raised a noble dog out of this ill-mannered puppy. Rex not only grew up but also obeyed all commands. And was always by his master's side. Well. Rex. Today you're taking us for a walk. Bruce said. Petting his pet. The dog looked him straight in the eyes. Barked. And turned towards an abandoned garden with pears. And apples hanging from the old trees. Wow. It's tasty. Terry took a bite of an apple. He'll make us some compote. Bruce looked at the woman. His eyes filled with tenderness. Terry stood opposite him and smiled. She caught his gaze and let her eyes droop with embarrassment. They returned home in silence. Each of them was thinking about something different. And did not want to disturb the other. Terry helped her master into his study where she saw some sketches on the table. She came closer and examined them with interest. Bruce. She cautiously said. You are excellent at this. The man stopped smiling and. Grabbing his drawings out of her hands. Threw them onto the table. Why do you do that? Terry couldn't stand it. Will you stop feeling sorry for yourself at last and take up your work? How much beauty you can bring into the world. How many people you can make happy. What do you know about me? The man shouted in fury. What makes you think I feel sorry for myself? And anyway. I don't need a housekeeper anymore. Get out of here. Bruce. Why are you doing this? Cried the woman. I wish you nothing but good things. Don't feel sorry for me. Don't look at my drawings. Bruce yelled. Get out of my house. I can handle it myself. Terry. Taking her bag. Ran out crying. She did not understand what was happening. It seemed to her that she did not say anything offensive to the owner. That's it. I've had enough. Shouted the woman on the way. I've been through some things in my life too. I'm not a girl to be beaten. Let him live as he wants. Bruce. At that time. Took out all the sketches he had recently drawn. Threw them into a fireplace. And lit them. Laughing hysterically. The man opened a bottle of wine and went to the living room. Don't you feel sorry for me? He shouted at the top of his voice. She thinks I have talent. You all talk like that at first. You all bow down before me. And then when you've taken all you want. You just give up. Where's Sandra? Where are my kids? Where's Phil? Where are my new employees? Where's Johanna? There's no one near me now. The man emptied the entire bottle and fell asleep on the couch. He woke up to a loud noise. Something fell on the floor. Bruce opened his eyes and was horrified to see his house bursting into red flames. There was nothing to breathe in the living room. The man moved into his wheelchair and wanted to leave the house. But a board fell from the ceiling and blocked his way. The wheelchair overturned. And Bruce fell. As soon as Rex smelled that something was happening in the house. He jumped up with all his might and flew over the fence. The dog rushed forward at full speed. When Terry heard familiar barking under her window. She looked out and was frightened. Rex was howling like a madman and wouldn't stop. Terry quickly ran outside and asked the neighbor for a ride. In five minutes. They were at the scene. Bruce's house was on fire. Terry immediately called the fire department. Rex kept tearing into the house. And Terry, opening the door, followed him. Finally, the dog barked, and Terry saw Bruce on the floor, unconscious. She pulled him outside and then brought cold water and splashed Bruce's face. The man came to his senses. Bruce sobbed. Terry, God, you're alive. Bruce. I love you so much. 
Terry forgave him. The man said quietly. I'm such a fool. God gave me a second chance. And I rejected it. Terry. I need you so much. I can't live without you. An ambulance came and took Bruce away. Fortunately. He had no burns. He was given in four. And after a few hours. He felt good and was discharged. Where are we going to live now? The man sighed. Looking at the half-burned house. Don't worry. Well think of something. Terry encouraged him. The main thing is that the guest house didn't burn down. We can live there for now. And then we'll gradually renovate the house. Terry. Thank you. The man took her hand. Stay with me tonight. They'll just bring some things from my home. Because all the things in the house are so stinky. With smoke that we won't even take a blanket from there. An hour later. Terry returned with the blanket and pillows and prepared Bruce's bed. Terry. When I was little. Do you know what I used to dream about? Said the man. Looking at the stars through the big window. I thought that when I grew up. I would definitely fly on spaceships to other planets. I looked at the stars and imagined what flowers and trees could be on them. I saw huge transparent daisies that shimmered in the light. In my head. I had images of trees whose branches grew not downward but upward. Bruce. What happened to your parents? The woman asked cautiously. My mom got sick when I was in my twenties. The man sighed. The cancer turned out to be transient. My father couldn't live without my mom. And two months later. His heart stopped in his sleep. After that heart-to-heart -heart talk. It seemed to Terry that the fire not only burned. Bruce's house but also burned away. The remnants of the past inside it. It was as if Bruce began to live again. Good morning. The door to the guest house opened. And Terry put breakfast on the table. Well. Come on. Get up. Something must be done about your house. After breakfast. They looked around the house and what was left of it. A sad sight was revealed to them. Terry. He'll start working again. Bruce said confidently. He'll start a new company. We'll make money and renovate our house. Terry was overjoyed that Bruce was ready to return to life. And she wanted to be useful too and be part of his life. Bruce. I can go to work somewhere or do something in your company. She looked him straight in the eye. I am not going to sit idle at home. I want to do something too and. Most of all. Support you in everything. Bruce realized that he had met not only a good person. But also a reliable friend and a conscientious partner. And the best woman in the world. He added. All day long. They put things in order and cleared the garbage. Suddenly. The phone rang. Bruce. The woman said. And Bruce caught his breath. It seemed like an eternity to him when someone spoke again. Bruce. I finally got through to you. Why haven't you been letting me talk to you all this time? Joanna asked reproachfully. I asked Phil so many times to talk to you. But he always told me that you insisted that all business. Should be conducted through him. I've been looking for your phone number for a long time. And only thanks to my husband's connections I finally managed to find it. Joanna. I'm sorry. But I didn't know anything. Bruce said in shock. Phil didn't tell me anything after he bought out my company. I never saw him again. I don't understand. According to Phil. You've been supervising our project through him all this time. He told me what happened to you. I'm so sorry. Bruce. Phil promised me that as soon as you're better. You'll personally take over the project again. Meanwhile. He was in charge of the work. 
I agreed to Phil's terms because I thought you'd be back soon. By the way, Phil moved here with his wife Sandra and two children. The eldest of whom is her son from her first marriage. Bruce. Phil has been in charge of the project for over nine months now. And everything has failed. He doesn't understand anything. A week ago. I had to kick him out. He kept asking for more money than the contract. And he did it on your behalf. Is he true? But even with the extra payments. Phil blew it. I don't know what to do now. We were counting so much on this garden. Bruce sighed. After talking to Joanna. Bruce couldn't come to his senses for a long time. Terry. The two of them set it all up. Bruce said in horror. God. So I had an accident not because it was icy. But because Phil had done something to the brakes. Of my car when he gave me the book. I started to study it. He went somewhere. He was gone for a long time. Terry. They both wanted to kill me all these years. Sandra cheated on me with him. And according to Joanna. Bonnie is not my daughter but Phil's. The next day. Bruce called Joanna back. Saying that he agreed to go back to work. Two weeks later. Bruce and Terry flew to the other side of the country. Rex really wanted to go with them, but it was decided to leave him with Mr. Selick for a while. Bruce stroked the dog. We will definitely come and get you. I wouldn't be surprised if by the time we get back, Mr. Selick will have taught you how to read newspapers. Of course. Anything can be. The main thing is that Rex is a well-mannered dog now. He won't be a problem. Don't worry about him. And we'll look after the house together. Bruce and Terry hugged the old gardener goodbye and went to the airport. On arrival. They were met by Joanna's man and taken to the hotel. At lunchtime. They met Joanna herself. Joanna hugged Bruce. How glad I am to see you. Don't worry about that. She pointed to the wheelchair. I have already arranged for you to see a doctor. That same day. They went to the mansion. Bruce looked around in horror. My God. What has Phil done here? He whispered. A real mediocrity. How did I never realize it before? Joanna assured him. Bruce. I know you're a genius. I trust you completely. Do as you feel. Joanna. I have some new ideas. The man replied. He'll tell you about them later. A time of hard work began. Besides constantly traveling to the site. Meeting with contractors. And going to plant nurseries. Bruce also attended a rehabilitation course. Through her channels. Joanna asked a famous doctor to supervise. Bruce's spinal rehabilitation. Terry accompanied him everywhere. She was his personal secretary. Manager. Housekeeper. And most important critic. Terry. How do you like this combination? Asked Bruce. Showing her a meadow of silvery grasses. With a scarlet tree in the middle of it. Bruce. It's beautiful. She replied. But you see. It's predictable to some extent. Even habitual. It seems to me that if the tree were purple or blue. It would have looked less ordinary. A purple tree. The designer scratched his head in wonder. Where on earth am I going to find one? He'll have to think about it. Though you're right. Some dark blue or purple shade would look interesting here. A year passed. And Bruce began to get up. It was real happiness for him and Terry. They rejoiced like children and even tried to dance together. Bruce began to walk slowly. Always with crutches. There were a few months to go until the project was finished. And everyone was very excited. Especially Joanna. 
rumors that Paul Goldberg and his wife were building. An incredible garden had been flying around for quite some time. Joanna was keeping the whole town in suspense with her idea. Bruce was worried sick. He practically did not sleep for the last month. He and Terry were constantly in the garden. Checking all the details. Finally. Everything was finished in a few days. There was to be an official opening of the garden. But Joanna and Paul wanted to see the miracle for themselves. Bruce and Terry had specifically refused to accompany them. I don't want to explain anything to you. Bruce explained. Let this be your individual experience. The couple entered the gate labeled. Paul Goldberg Garden. They were greeted by a large. Well-maintained area with numerous paths. Leading off in all directions. Oh! Exclaimed Paul. Where do we go now? Anywhere you like. Laughed Joanna. In this garden. It's all up to you. Well. All right. Let's go this way first. Suggested her husband. And they turned to the left. They found themselves in a very interesting place. With plants having large round leaves. Some of which could be walked under. One path ran underneath them. Are they tropical plants or something? Paul looked around with interest. Oh. Look at those flowers. The garden was divided into different areas. Each connected to the other. At first. It seemed like separate pieces. But as they explored. The picture changed dramatically. Is that your famous horizontal pine tree? Exclaimed Joanna's husband with joy. You know. It looks very interesting. If I had seen it separately. It wouldn't have made such an impression on me. But together with its surroundings. It looks simply marvelous. The couple wandered about the garden for an hour and a half. And the further they went. The less they talked. They reached the rocks where the white roses were hanging. This part of the garden looked incredible. Joanna closed her eyes and smelled the subtle fragrance of the roses. Ahead. They saw the surface of a lake and headed towards it. They came across a wooden platform with chairs. Joanna and Paul sat down on them and closed their eyes. It was as if they had completely dissolved in nature. After a while. The wife looked at her husband. Tears were running down his cheeks. The man couldn't stop. He looked at the lake and saw his true self reflected in it. I never thought I could ever experience something like this and from a garden. Paul finally said. Joanna added. I now understand what you meant. They walked back in silence. Each of them wanted to prolong their impressions as much as possible. The couple left the garden and approached Bruce. Who had been waiting for them all that time. Bruce. You're a genius. Joanna pronounced through tears. It turned out even better than in my dreams. Thank you. Paul shook his hand. It's very hard to surprise me. But what you've done. I would call a real miracle. Dear Mr. And Mrs. Goldberg. I kindly ask you to let us go home. Bruce said after discussing the garden. We would like to leave tomorrow. But Bruce. Don't you want to be present at the official opening? Asked the garden owner in amazement. I have done my job. Replied Bruce calmly. I don't need fame. Recognition. Or criticism. Some will appreciate my garden. And others will create something even better. And some will criticize. Now it's time to return home. And so it turned out. Many people were present at the opening of the garden. Some could not utter a word and could only sigh. Some analyzed every detail and tried to label everything. But is it beautiful? Said a critic. All the rules of garden architecture have been violated. Another replied. Rules are meant to be broken. This is a true sensual garden. 
you should come here not to view it but to discover yourself. Nevertheless, no matter how much the garden of Paul Goldberg was criticized, people liked it very much. With the consent of her husband, Joanna made it accessible to all people. Visitors from all over the country started coming here. A few years passed. Terry. Have you seen my latest sketches? Bruce asked his wife. They're the ones we discussed for Mr. Caril. Bruce. Look there at the window sill. Shouted his wife from the other room. Probably I left them there. The man went to the room. Found the sketches and began to ponder. They were now working on a very interesting project. Terry finished things in the kitchen and went out onto the patio. Bruce. Let's go and drink tea on the terrace. Mr. Selick is already here. And Rex. She called her husband. The woman was already putting the tray of cups. And brewers on the table in the middle of the patio. When a red car stopped in front of the house. Hi. You must be from Mr. Caril. Terry asked in surprise. I'm here to see Bruce. I'm his wife. The woman said arrogantly. Is he at home? And actually. What is the matter? Terry asked with interest. You are too talkative for a servant. Said Sandra angrily. At this moment, Bruce came out of the house and was very surprised. What are you doing here? He asked in amazement. Bruce. I'm sorry. But you were right. She said playfully. We need to be together. Especially if we have children. And you've realized that after three years, right? He smiled. I take it Phil dumped you. Sandra? Phil? Sandra perked up. What's he got to do with it? He has nothing to do with me. Yeah. Well. I heard you left with him for somewhere warmer. Bruce said with a chuckle. Well. That was a mistake. I regret it very much. The woman lowered her eyes. Bruce. I realize that I love only you and think not only about me, but also about our children. Have you forgotten that we have a family? Sandra. Meet my wife. Terry. Bruce said calmly. And not only that, but also my friend and business partner. By the way, Caustic has a brother and a sister. And I know that Bonnie is not my daughter. Sandra became pale. General acquaintances had told her that Bruce had recovered and become rich again. But no one had told her that he had married and had children. Over time, Phil got spoiled by money. He openly dated other women. And after a while, he cut Sandra's finances. In the end, she was left with practically nothing. Sandra. Even though you were always against Eddie coming to me. I am grateful to you. At least for the fact that you were not against our. Communication with my son by phone. Bruce finally said. I will fulfill my paternal duty. I've already opened a bank account in Eddie's name. And every month I transfer a certain amount of money there. Also. I will pay for food. Clothes toys, and school supplies, but for your own entertainment, expensive purchases, mink coats, travels, I suggest you get a job, there's no other way, I'm sorry I don't have any money for you, and I will never have, if you like, you can leave Eddie to me to raise, and by the way, now I demand that you finally allow him to come, and live with me from time to time. I will also be happy to see Bonnie here. I advise you to agree. Or he'll take you to court. To hell. You jerk. Sandra wanted to shout at her ex-husband. But quickly came to her senses. 
realizing that now she was completely financially dependent on Bruce. With a heavy sigh, she slowly wandered down the street away.